evening and welcome to our town hall to learn more about the council residential districting commission and the council districting process. I am council member Emmanuel Remy, leading the first ever districting process for the city of Columbus. A reminder that this hearing is currently live on YouTube and Facebook and is also live and being recorded for rebroadcast on CTV, Columbus's government television channel three. The rebroadcast schedule is available at www.columbus.gov. I would like to thank uh, Council President Harden for jo joining us this evening and certainly uh, would like to welcome our guest. We have uh, Nia Walters, our in-house counsel to, to uh, council, council to council, and legal analyst in the Council Legislative Research Office. Malik Moore, the chair of the Council Residential District Commission, and Laura Baker Morris, our deputy city attorney. Before we dig into the main part of this town hall, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Council President Shannon Harden to share a few words. Thank you, Chair Ramey. I uh, certainly would like to thank your team, uh, Lucy Frank and Jeffrey Carter, uh, and all those folks who have brought us this far, uh, namely, uh, uh, Ms. Naya Waters, uh, who's our legal analyst uh, uh, with the council. I'm very grateful. I also would like to thank Miss um, uh, Laura Baker Morris. Uh, she's working so close with council now on so many different things. Uh, I'm, I'm just very grateful for, for her time uh, and for the work that she's doing. Um, but, but most of all, thank you to um, the, the, the committee that we put together. Um, these folks rep are a representative batch of Columbus residents um, who are focused on the future of our city. And that's really the work that we have ahead of us is um, creating a structure for a council that will represent the Columbus uh, city of Columbus going forward. Um, what could be more important than that uh, in terms of uh, the work that we have ahead of us? So I am very grateful uh, for each and every one of those folks who will serve, who will um, have these meetings who will represent different communities uh, and then who will present to us an unbiased, un, uh, unvarnished plan uh, for us to then um, work from to move forward. So again, I appreciate everyone who will put in this time uh, and certainly to Chair Remy, thank you for being the leader of this process uh, and getting us to this next step. Thank you. Well, thank you, Council President Harden. We truly appreciate your ongoing going support of this important work. Today, we are excited to discuss the Council Residential Districting Commission and the districting work being done this year. During this town hall, we are going to hear a presentation from Ms. Nia Walters on how we got here, what districting is, and why it is important, and of course, next steps. Here, the chair of the Council Residential District and Commission, Malik Moore, regarding the process throughout this year. And then we're going to answer questions that have been previously submitted by residents. Without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Ms. Naya Walters, who will be sharing a presentation with us this evening. Naya, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. My name is Naya Walters, and I'm happy to present to you this evening. Um, give me one moment, I will share my screen. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the Council um, Residential District and Commission and the charter amendment that happened in 2018. Um, we'll talk about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Um, so just an overview of my presentation tonight, we're going to talk about the Charter Amendment, um, more specifics regarding the Commission, some of the challenges that we anticipate, and then at the end, we will also answer questions. In 2018, voters approved Issue 3 with a 76% vote. Um, that will give us nine districts with nine council members, and that will allow us to have more representation of our city population and a larger council all around. Um, it created the Districting Commission. And um, the first election that will utilize the Columbus City Council with the new districts and candidate criteria will be in 2023. Um, and then in 2024, all nine council members will be seated. Um, and at that time, we'll have five council members that will start with a four-year term 
and four that will start with a two-year term to stagger the terms for continuity. Um, in February of this year, we, we seated our Council Residential Districting Commission. Um, so we have our chair joining us tonight, Mr. Malik Moore, um, and our esteemed commission members, uh, Ms. Monica Serrazuela, Ms. J. Avery Frost, Mr. Jeff Cabot, and Mr. Dave Paul. Um, so now I'm going to get in a little bit about the commission membership. Um, the charter requires that an independent citizen-led commission be appointed March 1, 2021, and every 10 years after, kind of in line with the census data. Um, the purpose of this is to ensure an open and transparent process um, when people are creating the districting plans um, that will outline how the nine council districts of the city will be outlined. Um, four of those five commission members are appointed by a two-thirds vote of city council, and the fifth and final member is a appointed by the mayor and the council president. Um, interested candidates are to be qualified electors of the city, meaning they need to be registered voters, and the commission members um, should reflect the robust, robust diversity of our city. Um, there are a few things that prohibit you from sit, sit, um, sitting on the commission, one being a city employee, um, being an elected official, except for our precinct committee members, um, a candidate for elective office, and a lobbyist that is registered with the city. Members that serve on the commission do not receive compensation. There are several criteria that are required to be met by the districting maps that are going to eventually be uh, submitted to council by the commission. Um, so I'm going to run through those. The maps have to comply with all applicable federal, state, um, and uh, local laws, including the Voting Rights Act. Um, the districts have to be roughly the same size and population, with the largest district not exceeding the smallest district by 1%. Um, they have to be ge geographically contiguous, meaning they have to share a border with at least one other district. Uh, the boundaries have to ensure geographic compactness, meaning that we don't want to connect um, larger, um, denser populations together with low density corridors. So thinking of your cracking and packing, when you're thinking of like gerrymandering and things like that, that's kind of to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, to the extent practical, they have to maintain the geographic integ integrity of neighborhoods or community of interest. So think of your area commissions and civic associations. Um, and they should also, the boundaries should think of and consider the existing election precincts and geographically identifiable boundaries, such as your roads and waterways. Um, and they also, last but not least, cannot be drawn for the work purpose of favoring or disfavoring any political group. So we're going to talk about a little, a little bit about the commission business. Um, it's a public body, and all the records are public records under the state public records law. Um, a majority constitutes form to, to do business, so that means at least three of the five commissioners are required um, to conduct official commission business. Um, the commission will be creating a minimum of three districting plans, um, and as they're being developed, they're required to host non-community meetings, and they're all there to be recorded in a medium that is readily accessible by the public. Um, in subsequent years, these meetings that are going to be hosted in the community will be hosted one per district. The commission is required to provide ways for residents to submit proposed plans um, to the commission for review, and they're required to establish and publicize, publicize this for a period of no less than 30 days. Um, all the commission plans are also required to be submitted to the public for 30 days um, for public inspection and comments. So when the commission first um, releases its first set of uh, draft maps, they will be submitted to the public for 30 days for public and comment, and then they will take that information um, and assist them in any edits or changes that they're going to make to the maps for an additional draft. Um, on December 31st, the commission must vote and submit three maps to council. Um, including a statement of how those maps comply with the um, requirements of the charter. Council is uh, prohibited from uh, editing or modifying those plans, um, except as necessary to comply with the charter. Council will vote by the 31st of this year via an ordinance passed on emergency to adopt one of those plans. Um, the plans will be effective at the next succeeding primary and general elections and will remain in effect until 2031. So these will be um, adopted and they will go into effect for the 2023 primary and the 2023 general election. Uh, at, upon adoption of that plan, the commission will be dissolved. Um, so this, at this point, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the transition to the new nine member council. Um, I think this part is a little bit tricky if you're unsure um, of what the law says. So once the new districts are approved, like I said before, council will have a total of nine members beginning in um, January of 2024. Um, and so in the 2023 primary election, uh, candidates will be nominated from each of the nine districts by the voters. And in that election, um, 
they will be elected at large. So what does that mean? That means that the entire city will be able to vote on those candidates that are coming out um, of the primary election. And then again, at the general election, the entire city will vote on those candidates. Um, so that means that if someone runs, runs for office, they will be elected by the entire city, even though they have to receive their um, petitions and votes from their, their petitions from their actual district and their signatures from their actual districts. Um, so with that, um, th the staggered terms will help to continue uh, the ability of council to maintain con continuity as it moves forward. Um, at the first council meeting of the year in 2024, the clerk will divide council into two classes by drawing lots. And lot A will have five districts and the members from those districts, again, will serve four year terms. And lot B will have four districts and the member from those terms um, will, uh, the members from those districts will serve two year terms. Um, the election process. So uh, all candidates from municipal, municipal office are required to be um, nominated at a nonpartisan primary election that's held in odd numbered years on the same day as provided by state law. Um, all the elections under the charter are to be conducted and results certified in accordance with state law. If there are two candidates or less, then there is no primary required. However, if there are three or more candidates, um, a primary election must be held. So if there are five people that run, but only two that get certified at the Board of Elections to run. There's no need for a primary, but if there are three, there will be a primary election to um, determine who will be the top two that will go to the general election. Candidates are required to be nominated in a nonpartisan primary election, and they will be placed on a ballot if they have a valid nominating petition filed with the election authorities. For us, the election authorities would be the Franklin County Board of Elections. Um, and they have to have those petitions filed in accordance with the following provisions. Um, the requirement is that for the petition and circulation form and the validation of that petition are provided for nonpartisan nominations in accordance with state law unless otherwise provided by the charter or council ordinance. And for each council district, the petition must be signed by 250 registered voters of the district. Petitions must be filed no later than 4 p.m. 90 days after the primary, 90 days before, excuse me, the primary election. Petitions are required to have the names and addresses of five registered voters in the city designated in advance by the candidate or candidates as a nominating party. Again, that's 250 registered voters from their individual district. Um, the two candidates for nomination who again receive the greatest number of votes in the primary are gonna be put on the ballot for the general election and the person who gets the most votes at the general election is elected. Um, if there's a tie by chance, it is going to be decided by lots under the um, direction of election authorities. The qualifications of council members. Um, the reason why this is important is like because now that council is going to have residential districts where people, namely the members are required to live in their district. I think it's important to know um, what the qualifications are for a council member and what that means that they have to live inside their district. Um, so members of council have to do all of the following. They are to be registered voters of the city, they must reside in the city and the district that they represent for not less than one consecutive year um, prior to the primary election for such office. They have to maintain residence in the city and the district that they represent as the boundaries of the district were drawn at the time of their appointment or election at all times during their term of office. Um, members are prohibited from holding any other office except um, being a notary public or a member of the state militia or a reserve unit of the armed forces of the United States. Any member who ceases to possess any of the qualifications required for this to office and vacancy shall be provide, shall be filled as provided by the charter. So what does that mean? That means that if I live in my district and I'm elected at that time, um, if I decide to move for whatever reason and I move outside of my district, I will then forfeit my right to that district and there will be a vacancy and that will have to be filled um, as provided for by the charter. Um, this is a brief overview of our timeline. So the timeline was we started in March um, through July. And again, the commission will host nine community meetings. Um, our chair, Malik Moore, will talk about that um, further in terms of the dates and times of the meetings that have been scheduled. Um, we have a goal of releasing the, our first set of draft maps in September of 2021 and September 1st. Um, and those maps will be released for 30 days per the charter. Um, and then we will receive those maps back in a, and um, take in all of the information that we receive from you as a community, and then we'll put out a second iteration of those maps for the public to view it again for 30 days. By December, the maps will be approved by the commission and the council will vote and choose one of those maps. Again, council is in a, unable to make any changes to the maps, except as necessary to comply with the charter.
Um, some of the challenges that we anticipate are the 2020 census data. The 2020 data will not be received um, by local governments until September 30th of this year. So that gives us quite a time crunch um, with the mess having to be voted on and approved by council by December 31st. Um, so the initial maps, draft maps will likely have um, 2010 census data to allow us to continue to move forward with this process, even though we do not have the most up-to-date data. Um, this is the first time that we are doing this, so it is a work in progress, and we are doing our very best to do um, the best job we can and work with our commissioners to get um, a great set of maps to you to review. Um, an additional challenge will be COVID-19 and just getting feedback from the public um, and when to be safe and when to keep our members safe, um, the commission members safe, as well as you, the public safe. So those are some of the things that we anticipate may be difficulties, but we are hoping that everything moves um, just fine. So in addition to that, we have districting ambassadors. Um, these are the 10 finalists that were uh, selected in the top 15 that were going to be engaging and helping us to reach you, the community. Um, as we can continue through this process, um, it's really important that we get a great level of community engagement. We really want to hear from you, the public, and to hear what you what you think is important to going into the maps. What what are the issues that you see in our city and the ways that we can um, do our best to make sure these maps are equitable and that these maps provide a voice for all of the members of our great city. Um, I think that pretty much sums it up for me. Um, if you have additional questions, you can email me at crdc at columbus.gov, which is the Council Residential Districting Commission email, or you can email my direct email, which is niwalters at columbus.gov. As always, for more information, visit our website, columbus.gov forward, forward slash districting commission, um, and that will provide a lot of updates. You can find some information about our commission members um, and other things related to timeline. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank you, Nia. I appreciate that. We did get a, a question um, submitted um, that asked, would the person filling the vacancy need to be a resident of that same district? Um, make sure I got that all correctly. Would the person appointed to fulfill the vacancy need to be a resident of that same district? My guess is yes. Um, because that's the purpose of having the districts, but I'll let you expound on that, Naya, if you, if you can. Yes, the person that takes that would take that vacancy would have to be a member of that community that is that, that district is located. Um, what I'm unsure on at this time is whether or not they would have to have been a, a resident of that district for a year prior to that preceding primary. Um, we have deputy chief council, deputy council. Um, from city attorneys, uh, Laura Baker Morris on the line. Laura, um, would you be able to answer that? Uh, Naya, I, I, I agree with you. Um, they're going to have to be a member of the district. I think the question that we need to consider is when a vacancy is created, if it has the same one year look back. And I'm not certain that it does. So if we can continue taking questions, I'd be happy to go in and consult the uh, the charter provisions and see if that would equally apply to a vacancy as it does for an initial candidacy. Thank you. That would be helpful. And just to make sure everybody understands, you know, there are some nuances that we don't have every answer for, but we certainly uh, have very capable people uh, that can go and look these things up and and determine. Uh, the answers and so we are it's a work in progress and that's that's why we hold these hearings and that's why we allow people to ask the questions so that we can all learn together um, thank you again I appreciate that and so we're going to dig into the public questions in a few minutes a little bit further but first I wanted to turn the floor over to Malik Moore the chair of the council residential district and commission to share a few remarks and share the upcoming CRDC schedule. So Malik, glad it looks like you got your technological issues uh, taken care of. So uh, the floor is yours. And you're on mute. The quote of 2020-21. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your patience. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Chairman Remy. Um, and, and thank you to our community. Um, un, under the direction and the support of Ms. Nia Walters, I, I feel really 
confident that we can, as a team, uh, go out into our city and begin to collect um, concerns, feedback, information um, in all the quadrants of our city. Um, we will be sharing publicly today a calendar, and you will see that there's not a, a part of our city that we don't reach. Um, and we want to make sure that folks know that we're here to listen to them and to make this a successful process. Um, and, and again, please share your questions and and, and, and just join us in this process of, of just creating this Columbus that is for all. And, and with that, I, I just want to ask everybody to please continue to look at the city link to get the, uh, the updated calendar and to know that we're here to serve. So thank you all. Thank you, Chair Moore. I guess we got to figure out how to say it appropriately. Uh, let, let's let's uh, we're gonna get in that schedule. Make sure it's posted um, on the on the website and and shared to the public. Make sure residents know when the meetings are and how to join because we certainly want as much public uh, yeah. input as we possibly can. And and to your point, uh, Council Member Remy, you know, just in this world we live in, we want to make sure that folks understand that we're we're making these meetings virtually accessible. Um, out of a hope that we can all stay safe and stay healthy. And um, again, we, we can have our voices be heard and, and we can be healthy and safe. It's not an either or proposition. So thank you. All right. So now for tonight's town hall, we have received numerous questions submitted from the community. So for any of the, an the questions we aren't able to answer during this town hall tonight, we'll make sure to follow up with written responses in the following days. And we will, uh, I think most likely have a Q and A sex session on the uh, website as well. Is that a frequent, or maybe a frequently asked question? Does that sound right, Naya? Yes, we do have an FAQ uh, section already uploaded on the website. Um, these are more niche questions that are specific to the process. So those questions are up there, but we do have a, a plug of questions. But any questions that people do have, again, please feel free to email me and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Laura, is, are you back with an answer? I am. Sorry, Councilmember Remy. I was trying to find the raised hand and I couldn't uh, find that's it. That's fine. Uh, but I, I did consult uh, uh, with the provisions of the Charter Amendment. And what it says is that if a council member elected from a district vacates his or her office, the successor appointed shall be an elector of the district and shall have resided in that district for not less than one consecutive year preceding the date of appointment. So it does also apply to vacancies being filled. There's our answer. Thank you so much. We appreciate you digging into that a little bit. So our first question this this evening is, uh, can we couple districting with also lowering the threshold? Can we couple districting with also lowering the threshold for getting on the ballot? Why are a thousand signatures required to run for council when a thousand signatures also allows you to run for statewide office? This effectively keeps working people off the ballot. Naya, I think you're probably best suited to answer that question. Thank you, council member. Um, so districting is already coupled with a lower threshold. Um, per the new um, charter changes, they will require to have 250 signatures um, from residents of that district. Um, so members or people that are interested in running are no longer able to collect all their district, all their signatures from um, citywide, but they have to collect their initial 250 signatures from their district. Um, so that kind of eliminates that need to get a thousand signatures. So that will be um, updated on the municipal code website as that takes effect which will take effect January 1, 2023. How will primary elections work if multiple people run from the same district? And how will voters know that they are voting for people from multiple districts? Naya? So um, it will operate just like any other primary. So let's say there is Advocate Abby and um, Baker Bob who are running together uh, in a district. And let's say there is Cater or Kathy as well. All three of them are running in the primary. Um, so those three people will run, um, they will collect their 250 signatures, and then from that point, um, they will be effectively placed on the primary ballot. Because at that point, there's three people running, because again, if there are two or less people, there's not a primary, if there's three or more, there'll be a primary. So they will run for that district. They are gonna be voted on at large. Um, so that means everyone in the city will vote for them. 
um, or whoever they want to vote for out of those three people. You'll still pick only your top choice. Um, and then from that point forward, um, two of those people will rise to the top. So let's say it's Advocate Abby and Baker Bob, and those two will be um, going to the general election where again, they will be, um, they will be voted on by the public at large. So that means the entire city will vote on them. Um, and at that point, one of them will rise to the top and one of them will be elected. So what that means is that um, at both levels, both primary and in the general election, the entire city votes on all the candidates. Um, and I think that was, that's, was, there, that, was that the entire question or did I miss any of the pieces? Yeah, it, basically how will voters know that they're voting for people from multiple districts and that will be designate on the ballot, you know, district yes. one, district two, district three. Yes, and then uh, um, at, the, at the end, in the general election, I guess, there will only be a total of 18 candidates um, per the charter. So there'll be uh, the vacancy times two, and since there's nine of them, there will be 18 total. So at the end, they will- At vote. most 18, at most yeah. 18. Yes, yeah, at most 18 um, for the general election. But in the primary election, I mean, we can have as many candidates as who is interested in running. Yeah. All right. Will the nine district boundaries follow current Columbus Ward or precinct boundaries, or will they be free form? Naya. For me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's okay. The districts will be drawn by the members of, council, of the Council Residential Districting Commission. They are required, however, to consider um, the extent to the extent possible how to maintain a geographic integrity of neighborhoods or communities of interest. And then the commission is also instructed to try and draw the district boundaries using boundaries of existing election, election precincts and geographically identifiable, identifiable boundaries, such as like roads and waterways. Thank you. Um, may any qualified elector in the city sign a petition for city council member, regardless of what district they live in, or do the electors need to live in that district? Again, again the electors need to live in that district. <laughs> This seems to be a popular question. Yeah, for sure. Um, will a group of candidates uh, be able to do a slate petitions? You, like, like currently, you can have a group of candidates be on the same petition, uh, the same petition, and so will that be allowed moving forward, Naya? Um, generally, they are able to run together. However, because they are running in districts now. They will have to individually gather their uh, signatures in each of their individual districts. But if they want to team up once they have gotten themselves on the ballot, I, I don't see that big a problem. Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously people can, can align, but they, yeah, they, they, I think the true answer is the slate petitions is not going to happen anymore because you have to have individuals from each individual signatures from each individual district. That's um, correct. Will the task force be looking at where current council members live in order to draw the boundaries in a way to allow as many as possible to continue to serve? I'll take that one. No, absolutely not. Um, there will be no consideration of current council member addresses on the CRDC discussions nor on the maps. And, you know, it, it's it, it's going to be it is what it is when they get done with the um, drawing of the maps and after they go through this process. Um, either ca current council members that want to serve that end up in the same district as one of their colleagues, they'll have to they'll have to move potentially, or they'll have to decide if they want to run against each other if they want to remain on council. Um, how long do candidates need to live in a district that they represent? And will they be required to remain in that district their whole term? Naya. Yes, um, they are. They have to live in there one year prior to the primary of twenty twenty three. Um, so I think roughly May, um, I think that the only time that primaries are in like March is when there are presidential elections, which are separate from us. Um, and they are required to live in their district, um, within city limits and within their district, uh, for the entire term, a failure to remain in their district for the entire term will result in them forfeiting their seat and creating a vacancy on the council. Okay. Mm -hmm. And let's see here. We've got... Will they be required to be available for meetings with voters in their district? Well, uh, I, I'm probably best suited to answer that. No, it's, you're not required to meet with 
voters within your district, but I think it's fairly advisable that you make yourself accessible to the voters of Columbus. And so um, we, you know, those that, that decide to serve and want to serve, you know, make themselves available. And so, you know, that those are the best public servants that, that are readily accessible to the members of the public and especially within their own. But again, they've, you know, I, I think the other point to, to continue to reference is, although they're from a particular, a particular district, they also serve at large. And, and so, you know, from that perspective, not a lot changes, we, we will be available to all parts of the city uh, to talk through issues. And of course, the voters have all nine members to advocate uh, their, their causes with. What about current council members? Will they be required to live in a district unless elected at large? Nine. Um, everyone elected at large. Again, I wanted to stress um, that every, at both the primary and the general election, everyone is elected at large. Uh, current council members will be required to live in the district that they want. Again, in um, 2023, all nine council members will have, all nine councils will be written, running for their seats. So at that point, no one will technically have an official seat that belongs to him. The council members, the council members that are running in 2021, will only have two-year terms, and so an entire new slate of nine people will run um, in 2023 for whatever district that that is that they live in. Um, keeping in mind they have to live in said district one year um, prior, based on the primary. Will only district con contests with three or more certified candidates. So well, they only those will appear on the primary ballot, correct? So if two, correct. it's not going to district. If there are two people running in district one, they're not going to appear on the primary ballot. That's correct. If there were three, if there are three or more members, three or more individuals running to be a council member, there will be a primary. If there are two or less, um, those two will just advance to the general election or less if there's only one. Got it. Why make the requirement to have petition signatures be from each district if elect elections still happen at large? This was a question that we received on Facebook. And so the answer is, is that we're, we're following the charter language that was approved by the voters uh, overwhelmingly in 2018. Obviously, it's the first time we've ever, you know, had districts in Columbus. So I can't say that the plan is always perfect, up to this point, but it's a it's definitely a step forward, and so I look forward to continuing to work on this after we run through this process once, and certainly we have the opportunity to consider future changes, taking it back, to, you know, to the residents to vote on again in years to come. So, um, not necessarily um, going to be up to everybody's standards, but but certainly we we're following the will of the voters and we're going to make sure that this plan is equitably put forth uh, throughout the city and then after we've gone through it we might say hey we might need some uh, tweaks to it and at that time we'll take take a look at it um let's see never so we also had a question again about the number of signatures on petitions for the district so the the, the threshold today is you need a thousand signatures and candidates can run as a slate so that three people on that slate only need one set of thousand signatures in the new plan effective 2023 uh, each individual candidate will need to collect 250 signatures from within that district only they can't get it from outside the district to be a valid signature to be placed on the ballot so they will have to come from within that district and it essentially eliminates the ability to have slate petitions because if you you can't run with your neighbor in district two if i'm in district one because we have to collect signatures from our each individual district so um the threshold's lower but but obviously the challenges still remain to get out make sure that you're accessible to make sure that you're meeting the people within the district that you represent. And um, that's, that's how the petitions will, will take place. I think I answered that. Did I do okay? Great job, Council Member. <laughs> thank, thank you, Nat. Um, 
Are there any other questions before we we're, we're close to wrapping up? I'll I'll um I'll give the opportunity to to the chair to to say any additional remarks. No remarks at this time, sir. Thank you. Naya, what about yourself? I'll just share the date of our first meeting that's coming up. So thank you to everyone who's attended this town hall this evening. Um, we appreciate you being here and sharing your questions and your interest in this process. We'll be having our first meeting coming up on Wednesday, May 5th. Um, it will be the first of our nine community meetings and it will be um, hosted from 530 to 7:30. Again, we encourage you to attend virtually um, through CTV, our Facebook or our YouTube. Um, and that'll be again on Wednesday, May 5th, starting at 530. All right, here's a good question that got in just before we were closing out. Could a potential council member maintain or own a home in one district and then rent an apartment in a different district with the intent to run for that district? I would say my uneducated, unlegal guess is that you would need to to run in the district that you're registered to vote and had been registered to vote for the year prior to running. Would that, how'd I do? Am I pretty close? I would say that's correct. I I, I would say it's the, the residence that you're domiciled in. So if you are a registered voter at that, at that address, um, if you're a registered voter, I guess at your apartment address, and that's the address that you use for your main business, um, and you've been there for over a year, I suppose that your apartment address could suffice, but that kind of gets into a tricky line of are you only moving there just to run in that district? So um, I don't know if Laura has anything else to add to what I said. Uh, actually, I'll just echo what you said, Naya. Um, it, it's residency, not just whether or not you own the property. So there are standards and, and, and uh, tests for whether or not you're a resident, uh, but it's also that you have to be an elector. And so you'd have to be registered correct to vote and that would be a lot trickier to kind of move about that quickly and also establish that one year's worth of residency in that in that location. Yeah, I mean, certainly you could own a home and for a variety of reasons move to, you know, an apartment, um, not necessarily just to run for something, but certainly if that was your what you did, then voters will pick up on it and they'll have to make that decision. Um, I got more questions here. Let's see here. Oh, yeah. So um, is the commission using a particular software for drawing the map? The, I know the answer is yes, but Naya, could you expound on that a little bit? Yes. Um, we are using the ESRI GIS redistricting um, that we obtained through the city's Department of Technology, um, and that is the software that we'll be using. They have access to multiple different layers of how you can layer like, your corporate boundaries and um, racial uh, like racial makeup. Also, they um, include the census data. So currently, like I said, we're, I'm looking at maps and kind of playing around with that using 2010 census data. Um, yeah, that's, that's what we've been using. Perfect, great. So I gave uh, everybody else uh, kind of the opportunity. Laura, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Thank you, Councilmember Remy, but I'm good. <laughs> All right. Well, certainly uh, we appreciate everybody's uh, input this evening, the questions that were asked. And again, we're not we're not closing those questions down. We ask that you uh, continue to bring them forth, and we will find the answers out to you and make sure that we get back to you. And then those that we may not have gotten to tonight, or there was some further research that needs to be done, we'll make sure I get back a written answer to you. Uh, before we bring this town hall to a close, I certainly want to thank everyone within the community for their engagement and feedback to council uh, during this entire process of the residential process. The more engaged our community is in this process, the, the better result we will have and, and certainly making sure that um, Columbus is, is represented fairly across the city. Thank you to our guests tonight, Nia Walters, Malik Moore, and Laura Baker-Morsh for, for their hard work on this important districting process. And Malik, thank you to you and the commission in advance of all the work that you're gonna be doing this year and you'll accomplish this year. It's it's certainly gonna be a, uh, a 
a, a formidable task, but but I know that we got the right people in there to make make it a come to, to reality. We couldn't hold this uh, town hall without the assistance of Angela Burks, Mark Carter, um, and our CTV team to help with our technology needs and connecting us with the community. Um, I also want to make sure that um, I thank my staff, um, Lucy, Lucy Frank and Lucille Frank and uh, and Jeffrey Carter, because their hard work and dedication really makes um, these things happen. I want to acknowledge and show my appreciation to my council colleagues for supporting the work of the Council Residential District Commission, and I think all we all look forward to uh, reviewing the maps at the end of the year and watching as this process unfolds. That is really all that we have this evening, and so uh, appreciate everyone's time, and we will look forward to the next meeting, and I want to wish everyone a great evening. Thank you.